Okay, in today's interview, we are talking to the one, the only, Don Durrett. Now, he's got an amazing book on mining stocks, on precious metals, and one of the longtime researchers and experts on the subject. He's also a regular here on our show. So uh, we're going to be talking about this idea of, of this silver squeeze on prices, on, on ounces that seems to be occurring at the retail level. We're going to be discussing the long-term trends and what Don sees taking place. So please make sure if you haven't yet that you hit the like button on the right side right over there and the left side right over there to send this out to more people. You comment down below your silver price prediction for 2021. We're going to get Don's here in a minute as well. And just last but not least, shout out to our channel sponsor, Vizla Resources, which I heard is gonna be changing their name maybe soon here to Vizla Silver, right in time for a great 2021 for our silver. So thank you, Vizla. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Don. <laughs> hey, Jake, thanks for having me back. So what's going on? Kind of a pretty, at least to me, it's a pretty exciting time. Now you're a pretty level-headed vet on what you see in the precious metals world. And you've been saying, got to close above 30. Um, and so what's your take? You know, I, I'm not sure if you followed that much on the retail level, but Jan Bullion CEO said, quote, the whole silver market's wiped clean. Um, and I, you know, a lot of places just don't have any. There's really big lines I've seen at a lot of retail. Talk to the, my dealer. He said, yeah, he said it's phones ringing and things are pretty dry. So what's your take on what's happening right now in the uh, metals market, in the broader's market, broader market? Yeah. Um, so first of all, shortages at the retail level is quite common. Um, so I've been following this since 2004. So, I mean, for the retailers to get wiped out of silver, um, for the mint to basically be out of silver or they, I, where they don't have any coins and you're, they're, they're on hold. I mean, this happens a lot. What happens though, when you get these uh, runs, if you will, on physical is that the price usually doesn't, you know, go up because the price is usually is determined usually using the paper market. So the COMEX determines the price and a lot of that is all kind of fake money, um, you know, borrowed money. They borrow money to, to short silver, um, you know, and you can borrow money very cheap right now. Um, I, I didn't see, we'll have to see, but on Friday, for instance, I mean, the physical market, you had SLV in one day on Friday, um, adding um, 35 million ounces, it was <laughs> one day. <laughs> So, I mean, and the whole ETF market jumped last year amazingly high. So we went, I, I don't know, I think it went up like 30%, like from 700 million ounces to a billion ounces wow. in ETFs. So where's all that physical coming from? Is that physical really, you know, the ETFs really holding it? You know, I, I, I don't think, I just don't believe that SLV can find that much silver, you know. 35 million ounces right now hanging around somewhere where they can just make a phone call and order it up. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening as far as this squeeze. So, yeah, I mean, the squeeze got people interested and they went and bought physical and the retail retailers are all out of silver. That's, that's, it's very easy for them to be sold out. They just don't have very much to begin with. Now they're going to have to reload. It'll take them a while to reload. Then they'll start getting some inventory in. And that'll happen. But now does the squeeze push silver above 30? Does it push silver above 35? I think you have to look at the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is gold. And the and what determines the price of gold? That's much more important than silver. Um, silver follows gold. So the, the GSR and then once gold, uh, and, and then what drives gold? What drives gold is the fear trait. The fear trade is people saying, okay, I need to have some gold to hedge against my stocks and my bonds. So we had a, we had a fear trade from 2001 to 2011, 10-year fear trade, pushed gold from $250 to 1930 and then it ended. Now we've had from 20, 2011 till now, the fear trade has been basically dormant. So we've had 10 years of dormancy of the fear trade, and now I think it's going to come back to life. 
Now, when the fear trait comes back to life in gold, now we have this new thing about, you know, uh, we have some, some of the younger crowd, the millennials are starting to be interested in silver. So silver has an explosiveness because 70 to 75 percent of silver goes to fabricators. Only about 25 percent is to investors. So if the investors push that over 30 percent, investors push it to 35, anywhere in the 35 to 40 percent range, there's not enough silver to go around. So you have about 800 million ounces that are produced, another 100 million ounces in re, that are recycled, and somewhere 50 to 100 million have to be come from above ground, somewhere in that area. Um, and so, you know, you got basically a, a supplies a billion ounces, and so if investors want 300 million ounces, 30%. Yesterday on Friday, they wanted 35 million. So if once they want that, then you start to get a shortage scenario, which is this shortage scenario I think is coming. I think it's gonna happen. And what I mean by a shortage scenario, I mean is you can't, is when the fabricators, you know, the Samsungs of the world, they can't find silver. It's interesting, Samsung, they're in the news today that they're making a deal with another miner. So let's say the apples of the world, Apple hasn't made a deal yet with any of these, these uh, silver producers, but, any large manufacturer of a vehicle or a phone or electronics, they need silver to, for their lines to keep going. So once one of them can't find and they have to shut down a line, that means we have a shortage. And that's when you're gonna, that's when the sharks kind of start to smell the, the, the blood in the water. And that's when you can't find physical. Then, and then, then they can't reload because, <laughs> you know, there just isn't any. Interesting. And that's what I've been thinking about exactly is from can the retail and the, in the normal investor market just move enough ounces where we already, you know, had, you know, re reduced, I think there was 760 million mined ounces last year. You're saying 70% of it's going to these fabricators you know, is there a point at which, whether it's Samsung or it's Tesla or it's big solar companies or it's Apple, that they step in? Because David Morgan told me it's not about the price to them. It's just about the availability. It makes no difference whether the price of silver is 150 or whether it's 36. He's like, they just need the availability. And is there a point, maybe that could even happen here soon, because of already supply chain disruptions, that maybe that could occur and give a, an unex, like a black swan wind to the price of silver where these bigger companies that need it just start pulling it off of delivery wherever. And then maybe even, you said some of the sharks, you know, whether it's the Eric Sprouts or some other people we don't know by name that say, huh, you know, I might be able to get 50 million ounces right now. Do you, are, have you thought about that? Have you, have you given much credence to this, this really being a possibility? I, I've actually been thinking about this since I wrote my book, the first edition, I think it was in 2000, 2010. So I've been thinking about 10 years. I actually wrote about the possibility of a silver shortage way back then. Wow. Because the reason why is just the, just the high percentage of silver is needed by these manufacturers. Silver is the number one um, electronic component. I mean, nothing really compares to it um, as far as, you know, they, they, you can use copper, but it doesn't work as good as silver and it's more bulky and, and then gold costs too much money. You can't replace it. So silver's kind of a, has its own little unique little niche there that, everybody uses, I mean, these computers that we're looking using right now, they have silver in them. I mean, you can't make anything without anything electronic today without it. So that's why I saw 10 years ago that, you know, at a certain point in, see, and then there's another piece to this puzzle that people don't realize. And that is very little amount of silver is actually recycled. So every time all these phones and all these computers and cars, they use a little bit of silver and then they, they destroy them. They go in landfills and they do not get recycled. So most of your silver disappears. It's gone, poof. 
um, there's such a little amount of silver in a computer. It's like, no, I'm not going to recycle the, the silver in a computer. I'm not, you know, and the electronics, you know, in a car. Um, I was reading where all these different type little pieces in the car, little electronics, you know, they all have a little bit of silver in them. But it's, it, it's there's no way they're not going to recycle all that, those little tiny little bits of it, right? So you don't have the whole, huge recycling, right? Recycling's down to about 100 million ounces a year. That's, it's dropped quite a bit. We used to recycle a lot of, of, of film. Film used to be huge, right? But now we're all digital, so they don't, we don't use film anymore. Film used to be the number one thing that was recycled. So now we have, we're having you know, less and less. And so, and, 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 and like I said, it's, it's kind of the oh, above ground inventory, you know, it keeps shrinking, if you will. So we don't have a lot of silver above ground. Now, yeah, there's a, there's a, there, there is a ton of it like in silverware that can be recycled. I think you're talking about uh, like 15 billion ounces of silverware, right? Or jewelry. You have a lot of, of, of silverware and jewelry that could be recycled and it, as silver prices go higher, but will it be enough to kind of, will people turn it in? Will they recycle it to kind of offset if shortages kick in? Now, I don't expect shortages to kick in until above $40. Okay. Now, we're, we're, it's interesting this happening in under 30 that we're actually, we're talking about this. But, you know, we don't, nobody, no, no big manufacturers are having trouble finding silver yet. But I think once you get it, I think the retail crowd. This is why do you think, why do you think that they're not having any trouble? Do you think any of them are smelling trouble? Maybe they didn't have trouble two weeks ago. But just, I'm sorry to cut you off because I'm sure you're about to say something great, but just to hit that there, do you think it's just because it's kind of really only happened in 72 hours? Do you think that the, the punches that have been thrown and the disruptions from supply chain might breed it in conversations now or still not yet till we get up to, toward 40? Uh, the key number here is production. So silver, like you said, you said 760 million ounces last year. And that was low because of COVID. It would have been 80 million if it wasn't for COVID, 800 million. So you're looking really at 800 million ounces produced. So it's a lot of silver. I mean, you're talking about 70, 80 million ounces of silver. You know, it basically comes on the market every month. Basically, it's mined, gets smelted, gets, you know, go to the refinery and goes to the, goes to the manufacturer. So you, ha you have steady flow. Oh of yeah. silver. And so since you, that's, that silver just keeps coming in, coming in, coming in, the only way that you really have a, have a shortage, it, it has to be severe. And we, and that hasn't happened. And some people say, you know, you never get, you're never going to have a shortage, but now I'll get back to the point I was going to make. The retail crowd really doesn't get interested in silver until it gets pricey. $18 silver, the retail crowd could care less, 22, 24, 25, could care less about silver. Once silver gets over 30, 32, 35, it's kind of weird. But then all of a sudden, the retail crowd wants silver. Everybody loves silver at $40. <laughs> Last time we had a run, they love silver at 40. They hated it at 20. That's that, that same thing will happen again. And so once you get to 35, 40, that's when everybody's talking about silver. That's when everybody's buying silver. That's, and it just... And that, that's when you can have a, a shortage is when it really kicks into gear. And now we could have a combination. I, I was thinking about this over the weekend. We could actually have a combination of the retail crowd. When I say retail crowd, I'm talking about the over 30 crowd. Mm -hmm. We're the youngsters, right? 40, over 40, over 50 crowd. That's the retail crowd. Um, now the youngsters, the millennials are buying uh, physical online because yeah. so if, and if they start to really wake up to the fact that they do a little bit of research and they see the potential, I, I mean, a lot of people say silver is really the cheapest. And I've said this, when silver was under 18, I, I've had podcasts that said silver is the cheapest asset on the planet. Mm -hmm. I've said it many times because, I mean, we're looking at silver going over a hundred and everybody's like, no, it's not going to went over a hundred. It is going over a hundred. And the reason why is because of everything we've been talking about here, this whole dynamic about supply and demand. And we haven't even talked about economics. And you're talking about uh, MMT with the expansion of the money supply, where people basically want to have some type of a hedge against that money printing. Well, again, there's just not a lot of silver to go around for the investment crowd. 
And once once you get to 30, 40, it just, that's the one thing that people don't really realize is that once you get, say, $50 silver, and I don't think anybody can deny that $50 silver is basically on the horizon is very likely, right? I mean, when silver is like 15, people are going, 50, no way, right? But yeah. now we're at 29 today. 50 isn't that far away. And, and people are starting to realize, well, once you get to $50 silver, a 10% move, which is nothing, takes you to 55, right? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't take much to go from 50 to 75. Once you get to 75, $100 is like right on the, over the horizon. So you, you have to put these things in perspective as far as percentage wise. And plus, you can have a lot more demand. Like I said, once you get to 40, 50, that's when people start to recognize the value of silver. When, when silver is $18, $20, people, they don't really think of it as something as a valuable asset, right? Mm -hmm. When silver's 50 bucks, one little half, you know, one little coin at 50 bucks, then it's, people start to think, whoa, that's got some value. I, I, I want some of that, right? The whole, the whole dynamic starts to shift once you get to around $50 silver. And so and people are starting to see this. I, yeah, it's pretty fascinating to me um, kind of where we're at. But the whole thing comes down to gold. This isn't about silver. This is all, to me, it's all about gold and all of the fundamentals around gold. Silver's not going to 50 bucks without, without gold going, you know, 22, 23, 2400. It's not happening. You got to have both along for the ride. And this, what's happening right now, I mean, we might not even get over $30 silver. Um, you know, the old high, uh, we, I think we might have traded, I don't think we traded about 30. Maybe we did today. I don't think we did. But the old high in this intermediate high was 2980, uh, I believe. So we haven't gotten, we, we don't even have an immediate, immediate high. We might not even get one. We might go back to 25 over the next two weeks. We'll have to wait and see, see if this squeeze works or if, you know, the millennial crowd gets a little burnt out realizing that, you know, it, you know, they gave up on GameStop already. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm premature on that, but it looks like GameStop maybe has had its run. So what, let's see. Um, so what do you think will take gold to resume its move and um, head higher, you know, a lot of, just before this happened, the sentiment was pretty bad just before this, like, that's what's funny to watch too, is how quickly sentiment shifts from one polarity to the other, but it wasn't that good. And, and gold's been kind of in this range. What needs to occur there? And what are you watching? How do you explain it? Um, yeah, beautiful segue, because I think it's the most important fact that which everybody's ignoring everybody's just focusing on silver which is the wrong thing to focus on but before we talk about gold fund mills i want to talk a little bit about open in funds and closed in funds because this is really important so slv is an open in fund meaning that they had to buy they're supposed to buy 38 million ounces of silver on friday because it's open-ended so it, it's a continuous so the more uh, people that more shares people buy, the more ounces they have to own, they have to uh, acquire. And people sell sell their shares of SLB, then they sell silver. That's an open-ended fund. The problem is is that we can't really depend on SLV because they're kind of the bankster crowd. And it, it, other thing is, they should at least be if they were really trying to step to, up to speed, they would at least kind of put their hand up in the air and say. Ah, we can't find 38 million. We're we're trying, you know. They, you know, they're, they, if they're saying, "Oh, we got no problem, 38 million, yeah, <laughs> no problem," you know. So we have a hard time really believing that story, right? Well, the the problem is, is that all the there isn't any other open-ended funds that really that that are you know that we can really trust. For instance, P, PSLV, which I think is the best silver bullion fund, which is the Sprock fund. I mean, if you can't trust Eric Sprock, who can you trust, right? But the problem with the PSLV is closed in, so it doesn't add silver. Uh, the other nice one that would have been good is CEF, Central Fund of Canada, but it's closed in too. So we don't have any open-ended funds to attack. If we had one, they would be in trouble. If we had an open-ended fund to, to attack, we'd have a shortage in no time. There's one in England, but um, I, no, I think it trades in Switzerland, P, PHAG. 
I forget what it, it is an open end fund, but it's a small fund. What do you think about the possibility well, of someone like to, Eric coming in there and just like buying 50, 50 million or someone not named Eric that has money coming in and, you know, doing something like that. But, okay. I'll, I'll talk about Eric in a second. Let me finish it. So, so there's actually two, two open ended ones, but they only trade in London and in Switzerland. So that makes it tough. Um, you know, people will probably go ahead and buy some of those open-ended funds, but we don't really have an open-ended fund that we can really attack. So I want to say that. Now, as far as Eric Sprott goes, so you you really need, it, it's going to take a lot of money. I mean, it, huh. if you look at somebody that's going to try to do it, what the Hunt brothers did, um, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a small thing. So I don't know, if it, you know, I, Eric Sprott is one of the most bullish guys on silver that you'll ever hear. I mean, he's more bullish than me. I mean, I, I get psyched up whenever I listen to him talk about silver. I mean, I, so I said silver's going to 100, right? I mean, he's like, it's going to 150. So he, he's, he's more bullish than me. I'm, I'm, my target is 150. I, I don't say it's going there. I, I think it's going to 100, but I'm not saying it's going to 150. So my target's 150, and I think it could go to 300. But so if Sprott said, okay, I'm going to go, I'm confident it's going to go to 100, 150. So I'm going to start buying physical and corner, basically, you know, I'm going to buy as much as I can. Now, he's not going to say he's corner in the market because maybe you'll get in trouble for doing something like that, right? But he could basically start buying physical. Um, he can't do that PSLV unless he he creates a new fund or expands PSLV. But if he per, has just a personal account um, and starts uh, acquiring it. Now, my understanding is that if you buy and have enough shares of SLV that you can take delivery. So he could do that. He could start buying, you know, tens of millions of dollars silver and then take delivery. So, not only him, so what about gold really, though? I guess what you said I is- I would go to the important, important fact. Go ahead, ask your question. No, let's go to gold then because, you know, so we got, we got the uh, open and close interest funds explained and, and that's important for gold and silver. But you said more than anything, gold is the story and gold needs to go to 22, 23, 24. So um, what's going on there? Why haven't we seen much movement? Are you anticipating more of it coming or is gold dead? Oh, gold is not dead in the slightest degree. Uh, gold is in a correction phase that started in August. So we basically peaked at 2,075 and we had to have a correction. So we ran from, I, I think it was, in, it got down into the 1700s before in March 18th, I think it was 1760. And then it ran from 1760 in March all the way to 2075. So that was quite a run. And then we went, we corrected a little bit and well, we, we've been correcting. We went into what I call a channel, correction channel in, in, in August. Um, and so we've been in that correction channel. And I think the channel is basically 1700 is the low end. I just don't see us going below that. And we probably won't go that low. But and then the, the upper channel is 1950, in my opinion. Some people say 1925. Now the high is 2075. But if we get above 1950, that'll be kind of the breakout. And then we'll, we'll break out and we'll go above 2075. So the bankster's job is to keep us in this channel. And they're happy at 1850. And it's funny because when you follow this, you, you, you almost see it. I mean, it cracks me up how, how they basically put it right back to right where they will kind of want it. It just kind of sits there. You know, 18, they pushed it down to 1800 a couple of weeks ago, which is as low as it's been in this correction cycle. And then it, and then it go, get up to 1870 and then we're back to 1850. You know, today I think 1860. So this is the happy, I call it the happy zone. This is the happy zone for them, but they're, they're not happy about silver, but they know that silver really is, you know, that's not really where they need to watch it. it, it they, you know, some people are saying that silver could crush the whole financial system. And, you know, I say baloney. The only thing that'll crush the financial system really is, is MMT and debt. That'll crush the system, not, not your precious metals. Those are just one little auxiliary data point. It's, it's the debt that's the problem and the lack of, of 
creating um, wealth in the United States because we have too much debt for, too, for not enough uh, income, if you will. Our GDP can't handle that debt. So it's not silver or gold. But, but gold and silver are like little indicators of the financial system. So they don't want to see gold over 2000 because most of your wealth is tied up in the stock market, um, not most, and bonds. And if people run from those and run to gold, run to silver, run to Bitcoin, then the financial system gets weakened and then you get a problem, right? So it's the overall fundamentals that cause people to run, right? It's not gold and silver that cause, things, cause people to run. But at, did I lose you? Nope, you're here. Okay, I hit, hit, touched something. Uh, so I wanted to make a point. So I just wrote an article on, on goldeagle.com uh, where gold and silver are going for uh, this year, 2020, 2021. You guys can read that. And it explains my thoughts about kind of where we're at with gold and where we're going. So I think we're going to have a correction uh, in February, March, or April is, is my anticipation. It's sometime this year in the stock market. And this correction is going to be at least 10%. And when we get it, um, I think that's going to be your bottom in gold and silver. And then we take off. So in my opinion, we have to be patient and wait for the correction. You can't just throw all your money in, in the pot and say gold and silver are going to the moon. You can, but I think it's better to, 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 to keep some powder on the side and get, prepare for that, that correction so you can buy some of these stocks on the dip. Because I, I think a dip is coming sometime this year. And my guess is first quarter. Or, or April. So um, where do you think gold and silver can go by the end of the year? Um, that's a good question. I, my target is 2300. I think that we will trade at 22 or 2300 this year in 2021. Um, though I think that's a conservative target. It wouldn't surprise me if it, it's if it, we end up higher than that by the end of the year. But th th those are my targets: 22, 2300, very conservative. Silver, my target is really 50. I mean, I think next year is the year that we go 75 to 100. I'm not expecting to get to 75 dollars silver this year. Um, I think that's going to be 2022, but I do think we'll get to 50 this year, and my fingers are crossed that we do. Once we get above 30. I really think it'll be it'll take less than six months to get to 50. That's my anticipation with a one month pause at 35. So how much of your investment is focused on silver versus gold then? That's a good question. Um, so it's hard to be highly uh, allocated to silver um, because they're just, there's not that many using my method. So I like to have low allocations for my stocks. Um, my low allocations, most of my stocks is less than 1% of my overall cost basis. There's only 18 silver producers in the world with over 1 million ounces. So there's just not that many of them. So it's tough to have big exposure unless you over allocate, which I don't want to do. So what I've done is I've done physical silver, um, is probably my largest allocation in the silver portion. And then I've done uh, ETFs, SIL and SILJ. I use those to pop up my allocation. But the last time I looked, my allocation was 37%. Um, so of my total- Of your net worth, or are you saying silver versus gold? Uh, co my cost basis. Okay. I always focus on investing my invest dollars on cost basis. I don't care about net worth. So if I have a stock that has a cost basis of 1%, but it has 5% value of my net worth, I don't care. My cost basis is 1%. I have focus on cost basis. So it's 37% of my cost basis, which I think is about right, 30 to 40. Um, it's tough to, like I said, the way I invest, it's tough to get over 40% because you have to over allocate, you know, and that's the kind of tough to do. Unless you're super, super bullish, then you can just go long physical and take, you know, a huge allocation. So let me ask you, um, what do you, let's look macro. What do you kind of foresee happening here in 2021? Let's talk a little bit about what you're thinking. You know, we've got 
obviously an incredible amount of people that still don't have jobs. You have an incredible amount of people that aren't paying the rent. We have an incredible amount of people that aren't paying their mortgage. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a mess to sum it up. And democratic administration. Mm-hmm. Um, so people were expecting the stimulus to come, but that still hasn't come. And now there's feet dragging in the, you know, the political poly- uh, drama. What do you see happening here in 2021 um, in America and the Western world and the, in the uh, financial and, and social systems? Well, I love that question. We're, we're really giving your audience some meat today. I'll tell you <laughs> some bonus questions with a lot of meat on it. Because we were just going to talk really about the silver squeeze, but now we're going to go into really the nitty gritty of the U.S. economy. So in my opinion, uh, what we're seeing right now is a transition point away from, this goes all the way back to when America came into its own after the World War, after World War II, where America became the dominant economy of the world. And right now, I think that 2020 was the transition point. And now we're going to see the the loss, if you will, of America's influence around the world. And I think this is directly related to the dollar and this is directly related to MMT. I think that it all basically is going to revolve around Southeast Asia. I think Southeast Asia now is kind of the juggernaut of economic growth in the world. And the reason why is because they use mercantilistic economies where they grow wealth. They don't grow debt, they grow wealth. We grow debt. Uh, Now you can say Japan has high debt, but they're still a mercantilistic society uh, with positive trade deficit. So they get away with it. They are able to finance their debt locally. We don't do that. We finance ours externally through foreign money. Also, the US economy has basically been running a Ponzi scheme because we have the the dominance of the US dollar, which is the global reserve. Now, what I mean by Ponzi scheme is that we, the U.S. dollar is basically hollowed out. The U.S. economy is hollowed out. But yet we are loaning people money in the, to investors who are basically giving us money, good money, throwing it after bad. So that money's coming in from foreign money, but they're not going to get paid back. That's what a Ponzi scheme basically is. So they're investing into kind of a hollow system. And people are going to start to see this in, this year in 2021. Now, recently, China, they just bought some more uh, treasuries. And so the foreign money is still kind of hanging in there, but it's not strong. It's not robust. I think it's going to weaken. And I just see the U.S. economy. um, Yes, it's going to have, it's not going to crash. It's not going to collapse, but it's going to hollow out further. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a bifurcation of people that are basically well-educated, high technology jobs who are going to do fairly well. And in the bottom end of the stream, you have the service jobs, the $15 minimum wage isn't gonna fix that problem, that are basically going to be having trouble. So America really isn't gonna be generating wealth. Now, Trump could have fixed this problem. All he had to do was require any company that sells a product in the United States to, to make a percentage of it here. So it doesn't have to be, let's say 5% of all Samsung, any product that comes in Samsung, 5% has to be US parts. If they would have done that, we could have created a ton of wealth. They would have had to make manufacturing plants all across this country. There wouldn't have been enough jobs. Wouldn't have been enough. So we could have done it very strategically. We just said only we're only going to focus on high tech jobs, high paying jobs. It would have worked fantastic. Now the reason why I say you know it's too late, we're not going there, is because the Democratic administration, no way are they going to do something like that. Um, it's just not in their, in their DNA. They don't think strategically economically. So the Trump, I mean, he had a shot at it because he said, we're going to make America great again. That's how we would have made America great again. So instead, we're going to have this bifurcation where you have basically more rich people and less, I mean, you know, at the top, concentrated at the top, kind of what we have. And then more and more college students having a hard time finding high paying jobs. It's just, and then you're going to have, you know, the whole U.S. economy having a really, really hard time growing. So we're going to go through this, you know, Jap- Jap- Japanization of the America where you start muddling. So the U.S. economy is going to start muddling. Starting in this year, so it's basically a muddling transition where America's basically our 
economics might, if you will, withers. And so that is what's going to drive up um, the price of gold because of that uncertainty. So you have uncertainty about, around the world economically, and then you have the dollar, which is basically fading, in my opinion. Um, I don't see the dollar going to 95 this year. I see it going to 85. Um, and then once it gets to 85, I see it going lower. So it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a really bad situation for the dollar. And MMT is uh, an economic system. It's basically based on fantasy. It's based on the concept, on the concept that debt does not matter. That's the fundamental belief in MMT is debt does not matter. The only thing that matters is liquidity. As long as you have liquidity, then you never face bankruptcy. In fact, you never have a recession because the only reason why you have a recession is a lack of liquidity. So it's, you know, it's, it's I, I, yeah, I, I can call it an economic system. And I think the end result is an economic system that no longer has any, any way that you can have price discovery. So once price discovery is gone, that's what we're seeing in the, in the markets right now. And it just is so slow whittling away, if you will. And that's what we're experiencing, a whittling away um, and into a muddling process into, um, you know, I, it's going to get better, but not for a while. I would say five years. I'd, I'd say we're going right now through a five-year transition point. And who knows what, what, how we're going to come out the other end. But I, I know one thing, we're going to come out the other end uh, changed. <laughs> a new economic system to, to a high degree, I think. What does that look like kind of in conclusion? I think that's a good way well, to I, shift to the, to the, you know, yeah. finish the macro. You said a new system to a high degree. What does that mean? So I, I read a new, wrote a new constitution. So I, my feeling is that we have to start over because the current system is kind of broken. I mean, the left is giving up on giving up on capitalism. Um, so if they're giving up on capitalism, you know, and that's not the right way. That's not the right answer. So I, I wrote a new economic system that kind of re, re, we redo everything um, economically. And, and some of the ideas I, I put in that book, I think will come to pass. Why do you think they will come to pass? And I say that because, you know, it seems like the, uh, the financial elites and the minions called their politicians, you know, are keeping this thing alive why would someone like Don, who's, you know, a great, a, an actual great financial thinker who has real actual interesting ideas, why do you think they would take them? Um, why do you think they no, would implement they, them? Right, right. So I wrote a new constitution, right? So we're <clears> not going to, the only way something like that's going to happen is if a, if a state secedes and creates a new country. Do you think that's a possibility? I've wondered about that. If, um, I, if a state succeed, because I'm contemplating even leaving America, you know, so um, I don't see how it's going to be stable here in that instance where the economy's hollowed out and the wealth gap right. written. So I've wondered in my head, I'm like, will Utah or Texas secede? I mean, is that a possibility? To, I mean, you know, I think it mean maybe if they have a gold depository, you know, they could secede and I don't know. Well, I used to think that Texas had the right to secede, but it turns out they don't. The only thing they have a right to do is to break into five states. Oh. So they could, and that's not going to create a new country. It's just going, and I don't think something like that's going to happen. But I do think that secession is a possibility after the United States defaults on its debt. Now, again, I said the U.S. Why do you think the U.S. would default on its debt if it can print the money? Because once foreigners, we have to do this externally. Once foreigners basically say, no, no moss, I don't want your debt. At that point in time, the Fed will have to monetize 100% of it. If they have to monetize 100% of it, it's inevitable you get inflation. So then they're going to be up against the wall. Do we create hyperinflation? And we see how that works, right? We've seen it in Argentina several times. We saw it in Weimar and Germany in the 20s. We see, how, we, see, we see how hyperinflation works. Zimbabwe is another example. It doesn't, right? So it, once you, if you get a super hyperinflationary environment, it destroys you. So the Fed's basically going to be up against a, a rock and a hard place. They basically say, look, we either default now and we can redo everything and get everything back on our feet, or 
look at look at the alternative. The alternative is hyperinflation. Once they get up, once the wall and the rock are both there, that's when they'll default. I don't think it's going to happen this year. I don't think it's going to happen next year. Um, but it's coming. And and then I think after the default, then I think you could see some see secession occur. I think that's a possibility. I used to think Texas was going to secede, but now I'm not so sure they'll be first. It will probably be a smaller state, you know, maybe Wyoming, maybe Alaska. Um, but again, now I'm going to go back to some of these solutions of where I think we're going. I might be a kind of a head of the curve guy, but in my opinion, the, the two biggest weaknesses in our economic system is the strength of the corporation and the lack of it equity, equality, the way that we, the people are paid. So if you have a corporation, for instance, um, if you go to work for a corporation, you pretty much are indentured to them. You have to do what they want. You know, you got to follow their rules. There, there's no balance. There's, the balance is basically they are, have all the power, you have none. So what I see coming is more of an equitable uh, partnership with corporations and their employees. And how that occurs is through pay, how you pay them. So what I see is a flattening of the pay scale and kind of a, a, team, a team type of, of system. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, this is total socialist and communism. It's not free market. Well, you know, the free markets, we got it. We need free markets. We need small government. But we also have to have economic systems that work. And so if you have a corporation, let's say that you only have five pay scales. There's only five, right? So you have the entry level and then you have the CEO level. Those are the, the biggest, widest. That's the widest you can get is one through five. And everybody is paid one through five. You're either one, two, three. Everybody, you know what you are. Everybody knows what you are and everybody knows what they get paid. You know what a three gets paid. You know what a four gets paid. And you go up the scale. So you can get better, right? But my system does is that, that bottom scale is much closer to the top and it creates more fairness because right now what happens is the very top of a corporation, they basically keep all the money themselves. They get all, all, the, all the stock options. There's just not a lot of equity there. So if you redo it, you basically you flatten that pay scale, make it one to five. Like right now, the, the CEO is making 20 million on average in, in the country and, and the secretary or the entry level clerk is making minimum wage or maybe, you know, 10 bucks an hour, right? So you got 10 bucks an hour versus 20 million, right? That's a huge discrepancy. So I'm saying, let's take that and go five to one, right? And that, that's basically is going to solve a lot of that. And then simultaneous to that, you start to create kind of a teamwork atmosphere where people kind of matter. And then you have this home life. The other thing I do is I cut the work week to uh, 32 hours, so instead of 40 hour work week, it's 32 hours and you only work a half day on Friday. You know, we need to do that. that that's coming where people basically get treated better in the corporation. You know, what's, what's happening today is it's too much of a one way thing. And we need to, we need to improve the, you know, we, we care so much about children, but we don't care about workers. I mean, what, there's just a big disconnect to me. You see what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, once you get outside of the once you get outside of the conversation of what should or is mon money, of course, there's a, uh, you know, I mean, then you talk about the education system, there's a million ways you could go there. But let me ask you in this vision, as final question, do you see us ever returning to some semblance of a of a uh, of a gold standard of a uh, bimetal standard of a currency backed by a broad range of commodities do you see anything like that in in conclusion uh yeah it'll be backed by bitcoin that's that bitcoin is basically it's the same thing as, as as gold it's basically a collectible it's basically something that's rare something that can hold value so, and that's the problem with, you know, they want to, if countries that say they want to get rid of Bitcoin, it basically helps them solve a lot of their economic financial problems. I think, didn't India just announce that yesterday, yeah, I think? But, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, wait a minute, you, you don't realize, and the, they think that their system works, they think that their, their, their fiat currencies work. And they really don't because you get in, I mean, look what fiat currencies let us down this road. It's led us to MMT, which is, you know, kind of a ridiculous economic system. So 
you know, Bitcoin is kind of the, the answer in many respects. I call it the currency terminator. So what's going to happen with Bitcoin is even if the major uh, economies of the world outlawed, like the United States and Europe outlawed, the, the third world countries will go, fine, we'll take it. We'll use it. We don't need your dollar. We'll use our Bitcoin, you know, and it'll work much, much better. Right. Because it's, it's real hard money. Um, so are you saying yeah. like if they stored it as their reserve current, as their uh, reserve, as their reserves? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, use it as the reserves, use it as, as the money they spend, use it to back uh, other type of cryptos to spend, the whole, the whole deal, right? And, you know, people do not realize what Bitcoin represents. Rep Bitcoin represents what email did to mail. That's what it represents. If you, if people say Bitcoin's fake, is email fake? That's, that's a good analogy. Um, so one of the I things that I came up with that idea myself, you, if you're going to consider email fake, then fine. I mean, email is the, ba the backbone, right? One of our backbones of our, of our, of our system today, our culture today, Bitcoin's the same thing. It's basically electronic money. That's, you know, safe and hard. And well, that would be interesting. One of the things that I've also been contemplating is, is or really out of optimism of the future, because I'm concerned about, of freedoms and many of the other things that I feel are going in the wrong direction in America, which has made me contemplate moving to another country. And one of the things that I've hoped, you know, there's also a, a, a belief that uh, many countries are going to be, are going to pursue this path of destruction of currency and destruction of freedoms. And so I've thought in my head, well, maybe countries will compete for the best citizens, you know? And oh, maybe that'd it. be a way you'd start to woo them, you know? Oh, um, oh, so. You got it. And I'll tell you, the one country that's competing right now is Puerto Rico. You should go there. Puerto Rico basically is not taxing capital gains. Yeah, that's what I, I wonder if there'll be a lot of shifts to bring people that create jobs and opportunities that's in the countries because many of these countries GDP have been destroyed even worse because of these lockdowns. So I've, I've been wondering if it'll make any of them creative and competitive. Uh, so I think that's an exciting way to, to, um, to end for everyone listening. Um, in the description right there down below, we have Don's website for gold and silver stocks right there down below for you to click in and check out. Please make sure you hit the like button on the right side, the left side, send this out to more people on the right and left. Don said he thinks there's a real strong feeling that we're gonna have $50 silver in 2021. Let us know your price prediction for 2021 right there down below in the comments. And be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss any episodes. So thanks for joining Don.